This weekend, on November 11th, we will mark the anniversary of the armistice that put an end to the First World War. The guns fell silent on the 11th hour of the 11th day of the 11th month of 1918. At the time, there was great optimism because the, the horrors of that war, which was at the time the second most deadly war in human history, had convinced people that the, the people of the world would finally recognize that the whole idea of war was obsolete. And, of course, that turned out to be wrong. But that doesn't mean that a hundred years later we can't still learn that lesson. The Great War changed a great many things. And one of the things that it changed was the way that we venerate our war dead. The phenomena of venerating a tomb of an unknown soldier, which started after the First World War and has been replicated in some form in more than 50 nations, gives us hope that we might still learn the lesson of what was then called the war to end all wars. It is history that deserves to be remembered. David Railton was a chaplain assigned to the 47th Infantry Division, one of the first of the British Territorial Divisions to be sent to France in March 1916. Chaplains held the equivalent of a military rank of captain, but received the pay of a first lieutenant. While Padres were not always well liked by troops during the Great War, and in fact Anglican Padres were particularly called out for not placing themselves at risk, Railton was an exception. He was known for accompanying men into the thick of the fight and was awarded the Military Cross, an award for valor, for saving an officer under fire. A padre was only obligated for a year's service, but Railton lamented that difference with the line officers who were generally committed to serve throughout the war. Unlike many of his colleagues, he chose to stay, starting in service in 1916 and continuing through the duration of the war. Like nearly 200,000 of his comrades in the British and Commonwealth armies, he was a victim of poison gas, one of the horrors of the war that was then called the war to end all wars in the decade before people understood that title to be ironic. He suffered partial blindness from the gas and also suffered from the ubiquitous shell shock that today we call post-traumatic stress disorder. Railton's memory of the Great War is well recorded because he carried on a regular correspondence with his wife. Many of the letters are optimistic, but it is clear throughout that he saw the real horrors of the war. As one letter wrote, I am tired of the war, of seeing wounds and death and mud and filth. One of the most trying tasks for a chaplain in the First World War was burial detail, where a chaplain would accompany the detail sent to recover the dead, collect their identity tags and the remains for burial. Returning from one such detail, in September 1916, he saw in a small garden a simple wooden cross that had written in pencil, an unknown British soldier. He described the scene in an article published in 1931. It was dusk, and nobody was near except some officers in the billet playing cards. I remember how still it was. Even the guns seemed to be resting, as if to give their gunners a chance to have their tea. How that grave caused me to think. Quietly and gradually, they came out of the mist of thought this answer, clear and strong. Let this body, this symbol of him, be carried reverently over the sea to his native land. He considered offering his suggestion to Field Marshal Haig, commander of the British Expeditionary Force, but he did not think the Army Command would pay attention to the suggestion of a mere vicar. Still, in 1920, he offered his suggestion to Bishop Herbert Ryle, Dean of Westminster Abbey, suggesting that remains be buried at Westminster, among the kings. Ryle took the idea to both King George V and the Prime Minister, David Lloyd George, who enthusiastically supported the idea. A set of remains, chosen at random and identified as British by their buttons and boots, was carried with much reverence from France to London and interred in the west end of the nave of Westminster Abbey on Armistice Day, 1920. The tomb was covered with a Union Jack, donated by David Railton, that he had used to cover hundreds of coffins while on burial detail in France. Called the Padre's Flag, it still hangs in Westminster Abbey today. The Tomb of the Unknown Warrior offered a cathartic opportunity to remember the nearly 900,000 British and Commonwealth troops that had perished in the Great War. By the end of the day, more than 200,000 people had filed through Westminster Abbey to pay their respects. By the end of the week, more than a million had. On the same day, a similar ceremony was held in Paris, making both the French and British graves the first to honor the unknown dead of the First World War. The idea of removing the remains of an unidentified French soldier and interring them in Paris had first been suggested to the French government in 1916. It is symbolic that the French tomb of the unknown soldier was placed below the Arc de Triomphe. Originally the plan was to inter the remains at the mausoleum called the Pantheon in Paris, where the remains of distinguished French citizens are interred. But veterans groups wanted the tomb of the unknown to be given a unique place of honor. 
the massive 50 meter high Arc de Triomphe was built as a memorial to the war dead of the Napoleonic Wars and the French Revolution. While the placement of the Tomb of the Unknown Soldier of World War I under one of the most famous landmarks in Paris brings it more attention, the contrast of the massive Arc de Triomphe and the grave also symbolically represent the difference in the understanding of war, with the humbling experience of France's 1,150,000 war dead marking a cause more solemn than celebratory. After the suffering of the Great War, giant monuments to victory like the Arc de Triomphe simply no longer made sense. Three years later, on Armistice Day 1923, the Eternal Flame was added to the memorial. It is described as the first Eternal Flame lit in Western Europe since the Vestal Virgin Fire was extinguished in the 4th century. While the flame is never extinguished, it is rekindled every day at 6.30 p.m. by members of veterans associations, a tradition that continued even during the German occupation during the Second World War. Shown here is the flame being rekindled in 1954 by Eugene Bullard, an American citizen who volunteered during the Great War with the French Foreign Legion, and who became one of the most highly decorated soldiers of the French Army. Foreign dignitaries often lay a wreath at the tomb, and one such visit by President John Kennedy and First Lady Jacqueline Kennedy in 1961 was said to inspire Jacqueline, after her husband's assassination, to request that an eternal flame be placed as a memorial at her husband's gravesite at Arlington National Cemetery. Eternal flames are common motifs. An eternal flame also decorates Belgium's Tomb of the Unknown Soldier, placed in 1922, and the Italian Tomb of the Unknown Soldier, placed under a statue of the goddess Roma at the National Monument to Victor Emmanuel II in Rome. The Italian Tomb of the Unknown Soldier, memorializing Italy's 650,000 military casualties of the Great War, was dedicated in 1921, the same year as similar tombs were dedicated in the United States and Portugal. First proposed in 1920, the idea was encouraged by the dedication of the British and French memorials. The original idea was to inter the unknown soldier at the Pantheon, but the government decided instead that the remains would be entombed at the monument to King Victor Emmanuel II, the first king of United Italy. As the remains were taken from the battlefields to Rome, the train stopped 120 times at various villages where people could pay their respects. Italy's experience was unique, however, as nation-building and political interpretations of this cult of the fallen were largely exploited by the following fascist dictatorship. Thus, the tomb was often used as a favored stage for fascist rallies and celebrations. This use demonstrated how the shared notions of national grief can be interpreted differently in different cultures and environments. Still, the tomb and national grief over war casualties retained its meaning after the fascists fell from power. Today, guards of honor, alternatingly selected from the Marine, Infantry, and Air Divisions, stand on guard of the tomb day and night. Also in 1921, on Armistice Day, in the presence of President Harding and other government, military, and international dignitaries, the unknown soldier representing America's 116,000 soldiers killed during the Great War was buried with highest honors beside the Memorial Amphitheater at Arlington National Cemetery in Virginia. But it was not the memorial that you recognize today. Rather, in 1921, a simple flat marble tomb contained the remains. Congress had not yet appropriated the money for the sculpted monument. Despite the ceremony dedicating the tomb, the 1921 tomb was so unassuming that people would sometimes picnic on top of it. The tomb did not have a guard until 1925, and the 24-hour military guard was not posted until 1937. The monument that we know today was not completed until 1931. While the design was done by sculptor Thomas Jones, he actually did the sculpture in clay and created a die. The stonework was done by the famous Pichirilli brothers, who had also done the stone carving for sculptor Daniel Chester French's seated Abraham Lincoln in the Lincoln Memorial, as well as the famous lions named Patience and Fortitude at the front of the New York Public Library. The ceremony and traditions surrounding the tomb guards at Arlington have developed over time. At first, the tomb guards were drawn from the 3rd Cavalry, but since 1948, the guards have been members of the 3rd Infantry Regiment. Being selected as a guard is a rare honor, and only 20% of those who apply successfully complete the training. So few have qualified for this elite team that the Tomb Honor Guard badge, worn on the right pocket of the uniform, is the second least awarded badge in the U.S. military, behind only the Astronaut Badge. However, not all the rumors about the Tomb Guard are true. For example, a popular note that has been shared on social media claims that tomb guards may never drink alcohol or swear in public for the rest of their lives, and that new recruits are not allowed to watch television. In fact, tomb guards are held to the same standards as the rest of the military when off-duty. 
An honor guard badge can be revoked if the bearer disgraces him or herself in a manner that brings dishonor on the tomb, even if that occurs after the end of the person's military service. But the standard generally only applies if the owner is convicted of a felony. Of 656 badges awarded since it was created in 1958, only 11 have been revoked. The Tomb Guard has developed an elaborate ceremony, including the famed walk across the mat, taking exactly 21 precisely timed steps. The U.S. is not the only memorial to have such traditions. The Tomb of the Unknown Soldier in Athens, unveiled in 1932, is guarded by Evzones of the Presidential Guard, who wear traditional uniform and march in precise sequence. One characteristic of the many tombs for unknown soldiers throughout the world is that the remains are truly anonymous. Usually multiple sets of remains were collected from multiple sites, and one was chosen at random. That is an important part of the concept of the unknown soldier, that anyone who lost a family member in the war may think that this unknown soldier could be theirs. The unknown soldier thus represents all the nation's war dead. The method of selection varies. The British unknown warrior was selected by Brigadier L.J. Wyatt, who had replaced Haig as commander of the British troops in France. The U.S. remains are selected by a highly decorated soldier, Sergeant Edward F. Younger. France similarly intended to have the choice be made by a decorated veteran, but the man selected suddenly fell ill. The man quickly chosen to replace him was only 21 and only participated towards the end of the war. He was selected because his father had been killed in the war. For the Canadian Memorial, established in the year 2000, a war grave commission randomly chose a plot number from one of the more than 1,600 graves of unknown Canadians killed in the First World War and buried it in the vicinity of Vimy Ridge. Italy, on the other hand, had a woman whose son had been killed in the war make the selection, operating for the symbolism of Mater Dolorosa, or Our Lady of Sorrows. Recognizing the shared sacrifice of the Great War, the United States, Great Britain, and France have symbolically given each other's unknown soldiers each nation's highest award for gallantry, the Victoria Cross, the Croix de Guerre, and the Medal of Honor. Like many of the more than 50 nations that maintain the Tomb of the Unknown Soldier, the United States has added further remains to represent different conflicts. In addition to the unknown remains of a fallen soldier from the Great War, the U.S. has added remains from a fallen soldier of the Second World War, the Korean War, and the Vietnam War. That last set of remains, the Vietnam War, was identified through DNA analysis to be Air Force First Lieutenant Michael Joseph Blasey, and somewhat ironically, that might put an end to the concept of venerating the tomb of an unknown soldier, as modern forensic science makes it unlikely that soldiers will remain unidentified in future wars. But the important question still is, does honoring the remains of an unknown soldier as a symbol of the sacrifice of a nation's veterans glorify that sacrifice and therefore somehow cheapen it and make it more likely that a nation will go to war? Or does remembering the cost of war make it much less likely that a nation will want to send its young men and women to die on foreign battlefields? We who choose to remember history can help the world make that decision. To everyone of every nation who has put on a uniform to defend your nation from war, thank you for your service. I hope you enjoyed this episode of The History Guy, short snippets of forgotten history between 10 and 15 minutes long. And if you did enjoy, please go ahead and click that thumbs up button. If you have any questions or comments or suggestions for future episodes, please write those in the comment section. I will be happy to personally respond. Be sure to follow The History Guy on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and check out our merchandise on teespring.com. And if you'd like more episodes on forgotten history, all you need to do is subscribe.